I believe that everyone has at least one great story that only they can tell. My best story is dedicated to discovering these tales and releasing them into the wild, one guest at a time. This week is a special as we will be presenting stories from cast members of one of my favorite television series of all time, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm Travis Tidmore. Join me as I discover James C. Leary's best story. James, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being a part of Buffy Week. Absolutely. It's been, it'll be my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Well, uh, how are you doing right now? Uh, doing good. Doing about as good as I guess anyone can be expected, uh, given the fact that the world seemed to have just gone crazy over the last few months. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a glitch in the matrix and um, someone needs to reboot the system. Yes, we're definitely in the all, It's all gone horribly awry. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I'm good. I'm, everyone here is good. We're all safe. We're all healthy. So that's good. what's important. So how is, how is everyone there? We're all good. Uh, good. Just trying to stay indoors and stay away from crazy people without masks on. So Yeah. And you know, being in Texas. That Which in Texas is tough. Not, not wearing yeah, gotta stay away so. from, gotta stay away from the people without masks but with guns yes that is very important well james what is your backstory oh well many years ago it all started on august 26 1973 uh no um so my backstory <laughs> is i i moved around a lot as a kid um not from a military family or anything, but I'm originally from uh, Long Island, New York. Okay. And that accent only comes out uh, when I talk to old family members. Uh, and then it comes out a lot um, or when I'm angry. Uh, um, uh, so I, I lived in Long Island for a while and then I lived in New Hampshire for like two years, which was weird. Um, and then in the fifth grade, my mother got remarried and we moved to Dallas, Texas. Okay. which was very much a culture shock. Uh, I had to go from use guys to y'all uh, very quickly. Uh, but because of that, I now know I don't have either accent, which, yeah. which helped, but I can do both. So that, you know, that was good for acting. Um, started doing theater in high school, um, was very involved in high school. Um, took a few years off in college to, you know, you know be serious and hated life without that outlet. And um, I went to A&M and at A&M was lucky enough to be part of a, a, the founding members of uh, an improv group that okay. is still in existence to this day. Uh, then after that, uh, well, during that time at A&M, we, we had met, uh, we went to go see a Second City Touring Company group uh, in Waco. And on that touring company were Amy Poehler, and Tina Fey That's and awesome. we were yeah it was an amazing show because there were like 20 people in the audience to see Second City in Waco Texas and so they were just having fun and we waited for them after the, sh the show to try to meet them uh, because we were you know we were all improv geeks and knew that Second City yeah. was this amazing mecca for Saturday Night Live and actors and all this kind of stuff and they didn't show they didn't come out of the theater so we were like oh well well, what are we going to do now? And it was like, well, let's go eat. Well, there's, there's like one good place to eat, and it was Chili's. And lo and behold, we walk <laughs> into the Chili's, and there they were. It was the whole touring company. So we went up and started talking to them, and they were so very gracious to us. Um, you know, they gave us the, the name of the person who ran something back then that was called Improv Olympic, but is now okay. just called I.O., which is sort of another very famous training ground for improvisers and people who go on to Second City and Saturday Night Live. Um, so later that year, we took, during our spring break, we rented some cars and drove to Chicago and took like a three-day long workshop awesome. um, with uh, a woman named Sharna Halpern and Del Close, and uh, who is sort of like the godfather of modern 
improv comedy. Yeah. Um, this is turning into a, a treatise on <laughs> improv comedy in the later 20th century. Um, I'll see if I can't start cutting this down. Uh, no, so can't. because of that, I really liked the city. And when I graduated, I found a job that brought me to Chicago and did Improv Olympic. Um, while I was there, did a lot of commercials and got my SAG card. And then ended up and made the move to L.A. And a few years later, somehow was lucky enough to get on Buffy. And that one job honestly changed my life forever. Like I would have never guessed that doing eight episodes of a show in full makeup would have led to me being able to travel the world and meet so many people and have so many amazing adventures, um, good and bad. Uh, so yeah, it was really, it, Buffy was one of my favorite shows. Um, I was in Chicago at the time that they were doing the casting for it. And I was one of the few people that liked the movie. Me too. Um, I'm, I remember going to see the movie on opening night, uh, sneaking into it actually. <laughs> and um, I loved the movie. I, th I thought the sense of humor was fantastic and the writing was great. Um, the execution. Yeah. But you know, yeah. I loved the concept. It was such a great concept. Yeah. And then I remember you know, back then it was like, oh, they're turning another movie into a TV show. Great. Um, and just about every young actor, actress in Chicago put tape down for it. And uh, I remember watching, you know, a couple episodes of the first season and was like, well, man, there's something here. And then season two just started with a bang and I was hooked. Yeah. Like from yeah. that, from that moment, I, remember, I think it was the episode where, Angel and Buffy finally have sex and he turns back into a demon. And from that moment I went, okay, yeah. this show is about, not about what you think it's about. This yeah. entire show is a metaphor for growing up in high school and all the horrible things that sometimes the humans are more monstrous than the monsters and the monsters have more compassion than the humans. And it's just, it's such a wonderful metaphor and what ties everything together is that everybody goes through high school yeah you know not everybody goes to college not everybody but high school is a is a a universal factor that ties everyone in and from that moment forward i i was you know every week watching the show i wrote a spec episode of it after really? season two finale um that no one has ever read uh <laughs> thankfully um and when i moved to chicago to la it was in the top five shows that I wanted to work on. And as it turns yeah. out, it was the only one of those type of shows, <laughs> five shows that I was lucky enough to get to work on. But it was, um, it was an amazing experience that uh, honestly truly changed my life. That's awesome. And in case people don't know, tell everyone who you played on the show. Oh, ha, yeah, sure. Uh, I played a character called Spike. I know it's been weird. <laughs> um, the accent and, you know, they did a lot of stuff with CGI. No, sure I played... That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, <laughs> I played Clem, the loose skin demon in seasons six and seven. Great character. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was, it was just supposed to be a little you know, in the first episode I did that with playing poker for kittens, yeah. um, uh, the character didn't even have a name. He was just called loose skin demon. And it was just supposed to be a under five lines and out the door. Um, and I was happy to have that. I mean, I got to work with yeah. Sarah. I got to work with James. It was a, it was a really great day except for the kittens who were a pain in the ass um, <laughs> and got treated better than all the actors. Um, but uh, luckily, um, you know, I'll throw in a few extra stories here. Um, that day on set, uh, you know, James Marsters and I started talking and we both, it turns out we both had history in Chicago. And, um, you know, if you get James talking about theater, that's it, you're in. Um, <laughs> so especially Chicago theater. Um, so we were talking at the end of the day, he, he kind of, it was a long shooting day and it was, you know, we were tired and, the, the kittens were a pain to work with. Um, and he came up to me at the end of the day and was like, hey man, um, you did a really good job. You'll be back. And I went, what? He's like, no, you'll be back. I'll see you again. I was like, all right, sure. This dude says this to everybody. Okay, fine. Yeah. And then a few weeks later, out of the blue, just got a call 
like, hey, can are you free all next week? I was like, yeah, I'm free. Of course I'm free. I, what, what else? Am I? Yeah, I'm free. Um, they were like, great, Buffy wants you back. And I was like, what? And that was for Older and Far Away. Um, uh, older and Far Away or Life Serial? I think it was Older and Far Away where they're all stuck in the house. And yeah. that for me was an incredible because I got to work with almost everybody in the cast except for Tony. Um, and it was just, a, it was, I got to be there for an entire eight days of shooting. And on the first day, showed up and Marsters was like, see, told you. It was like the first thing out of his mouth was like, told you. That's so awesome. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. That's awesome. Well, James, what is your best story? My best story? God, you're, that's like asking me which of my children is my favorite. <laughs> like, there's so many good stories. I don't, I don't know, like, best story. That's like, I did a lot of stupid stuff in high school and plenty of stupid <laughs> stuff in college. Oh, I'm sure I've forgotten a lot of the stories. Um, I've woken up naked in hotel hallways twice. Um, so there's so many stories. Um, I, I could tell you a little one, um, and it's one of my favorites. It involves Danny Strong. Okay. And uh, way, 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 way back, like 2003, right as the show was ending, um, we all started to do a lot of conventions together. And there was this convention in England. I think it was called The Harvest. Something along those lines that was just paying this crazy fee. And everybody was like, yeah, well, heck yeah, we'll do it. And they were flying us out like business class and putting us up in this really swanky hotel. And it was just, it was awesome. And the next weekend, as it happened, there was a convention in Paris. So that promoter like grabbed a bunch of the actors and was like, hey, I'll fly you to Paris and put you up in Paris and come do my, and again, here's a crazy fee. Yeah. And we were like, yeah, well, of course, <laughs> Paris, no brainer. Well, we get to England and um, it's a little, it's a little odd uh, because we were all supposed to get like some of the fee up front. Like the way it works is you get a little fee up front and you do, you get the rest of the back end. And we were all supposed to get this fee and we, we get there and, and we're put up in a very, very swanky hotel, like a really nice hotel, like a very expensive hotel. Um, and it just, a lot of little things start to happen over the weekend. Like nobody's gotten their upfront fee, but we're like, that's fine. We're here. We're signing a lot of autographs. They took pictures from everybody and we're supposed to be keeping account, you know, we're just signing all day. We're doing all these events and yeah. it just starts to get like, we start getting weird vibes. Like it's just something's weird. Something's right about this. And come the final day, um, uh, it turns out the person who had been running the convention was robbing Peter to pay Paul, was taking photo money to pay other. And it was like, there was no money. Not only was there no money, but we all got stuck since we had put our credit cards down for incidentals for the hotel rooms. They stiffed the hotel. They didn't pay their hotel bill. So we, when you sign a hotel room with your credit card and the incidentals, they say if the bill doesn't get paid, we are going to charge you. So all of us ended up going, like getting a month later, like $1,700 hotel room bills for four nights. Um, and it, so it just, it turned into, it was a nightmare. It was yeah. a total, can I curse on this? Yeah. Oh, okay. It was a total shit show. Um, but we, and then the Paris con, again, the checks that had been cut didn't cash, but we were there and we were promised that if we got to Paris, everything would be fine. And the ones of us that were going over, it was, it was myself, uh, Rabia Lamort, who played Jenny Callender, uh, yeah. Tom Lank, who was Andrew, Danny Strong, um, and Bailey Chase uh, from okay. The Initiative. And we were all like, you know what? We're here. The flights are paid for. We may as well go. Yeah. Um, so we go over. And, uh, you know, our radars are uh, attuned to high. Like, we're just, we're conscious of any nonsense going on. And we check into the hotel. 
that they'd put us in. And this time, none of us put our credit cards down yeah. <laughs> for incidentals. And once again, it is a situation that ends up very bad. Like the, the checks don't cash and there's no, the venue's a mess and like nothing has been accounted for. And so we're like, we're not doing it. it it sucks. We don't want to stiff the fans, but this is, this is not okay. This type of yeah. business practice. And the promoter then gave the location of our hotel. Um, so we arrived one night after, you know, cause we're in Paris. So, you know, we went out to have dinner and we all arrived back and there's like 50 people out in front of the hotel waiting for us because we had not like, we were like, we didn't, we can't go to the event if you don't pay the fee. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't the fans fault. So we all went up, every single one of us went upstairs and grabbed our photos and came out and signed pictures for everybody um, and signed everything. Um, and we're thinking, well, we're going to, ch- we're going to check out the next day and we're just, we're good. This will just be yeah. chalk it up as an adventure and we're fine. And at, at 6 AM that morning, um, one of the people, the managers who had booked us for these events, we get a phone call at 6 a.m. going, the other hotel got stiffed. They're starting to make phone calls. You need to pack your bags and get out now, or they're going to demand that you pay them. So we're like, what? And, you know, making phone calls, and everybody's throwing stuff in bags. It's like 6.30 in the morning. And in this Paris hotel, <laughs> this Paris hotel was on the Champs Elysees. It was a 275 euro a night hotel, um, one that none of us ever would have stayed in normally. Um, yeah. But it's this tiny little French, little Parisian hotel, and the elevator was about this big, like literally this big. <laughs> so you could fit like yourself and a bag in the elevator. So what we all had to do is we we all <laughs> we all put our bags on the there was a first floor landing and we all got our bags and we were like all right the 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 person who the manager had arranged for a friend to drive their car up so we could throw our luggage in the car and the car would take off and we would walk another way so we're like all right it's like 7 a.m and we're like all right here we go one two and we all just single file right out of the hotel not like blinders on not paying attention if anybody talks to us not doing like a whole new yorker like you don't talk to anybody walked out through the bags in the car slam the trunk car takes off we start hauling ass towards a, a train station and we're walking and danny strong at one point just turns and goes huh a jew having to flee paris not like this has never happened before and we just all started to crack up and it just, the ridiculousness of the situation just hit home. And we all ended up booking ourselves into really quaint little hotels later on and having a wonderful dinner that night. And it, that turned into one of like, it was such a chaotic, stressful time, but it was one of the best memories of that group of people. Like here I am walking down the street with, was Ruby a diamond or pearl? I forget if she was diamond or pearl from Prince's entourage uh, early on. I don't remember. So I'm walking down the Paris street with like diamond, Danny strong, Tom Lank, (laughs) Bailey chase. And we're all just like escaping this hotel so that we don't get hit (laughs) with the bill. And it was just, we were all very young and we were very naive. And it was just, it was one of those fun moments of like, when is this ever going to happen again? And had it not been for Buffy, I never would have had that experience, but it was just Danny turning and going, huh, Jew getting out of Paris. Weird. (laughs) That's awesome. That was, that was a fun, and it ended up being a very fun trip. And we had, had, we laughed about it for years and years afterwards. Well, it's good that you're able to laugh about it. (laughs) Uh, was... Later, some of us had to fight the cr- our credit card companies <laughs> for six months to make sure we didn't get stuck with those bills. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Well, that was a great story. Thank you so much. Thank for you. That. You're welcome. So, James, where can people find you these days? Uh, these days, I really, I've been really kind of staying off social media, um, just because the world's gone crazy, and I find that I get into a lot of arguments with people I don't know and whose minds I'll never change, but yet I'm crafting 
arguments well into the night, like three, four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, this argument is going to change this person's mind and to have them go, ha, 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 LOL, libtard. And it's just, it's just not worth it anymore. <laughs> um, but I, I can be found on Twitter. Uh, I am on Twitter at the, so, or the, the, the James Leary. And okay. uh, the same for Instagram. Perfect. And if you pop over, DM me or link me or something, I, I check those occasionally, uh, especially just for mentions and stuff. But that's where I can be found. Um, okay. These days, I work as a narrative designer for video games. And awesome. I, uh, I'm currently working for Ubisoft on a super top secret project that I had to sign a very lengthy NDA and cannot tell you about. Awesome. Well, maybe when you're <laughs> able to talk about it, you can come back on and tell another one of your stories. And promote I would, it. I would love to. That would be awesome. Perfect. I would, it would be my pleasure. Well, James, thanks so much for taking time out of your day and, and being a part of our Buffy event. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. And as always, I want to thank every single fan out there. Um, like I said before, you guys changed my life. So I appreciate it. I hope you're all safe and all doing well. Special thanks to James for joining us on Buffy Week and telling us that story. Be sure to check back tomorrow for a brand new episode as we're dropping new episodes every day as part of our Buffy event. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Our title music is Red, White, Black, and Blue by Peg and the Rejected. If you have a story you'd like to tell here on My Best Story, hit us up on our Facebook page, on Twitter at My Best Story Show, or via email at mybeststorypodcast at gmail.com. Until next time. Go live your best story.